Just so you know, I had no idea what we were singing until four o'clock yesterday, roughly. Gabby sends a text, here's what we're singing tomorrow. And it's so on point with, with my last couple points of my message today about Jesus being our one thing. Psalms 27, 4. Can you throw it up there? Psalms 27, 4. I know it's in my notes. Should be. I hope it is. Can we throw it up on the screen? You don't have to bring it up. Oh, back there. Debbie, can you throw Psalms 27, 4 up? You have to dig deep and find it. One thing I ask, right? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in the temple. That's exactly what we get to do right here. Last week when Pastor Brendan gave an altar call, and I, I really enjoyed having him last week, by the way, in case he peers in today. Thank you for coming. He gave an altar call for sick people. Do you remember that? He needed healing. And I got a glimpse of what God's doing in a response to an altar call. I got a glimpse of God making us a family. We looked like a family when we came to the altar. And this morning I walked in here, actually yesterday I felt it when I walked in here, I felt a real heaviness in this room yesterday. There was 13 of us in here that were setting all this up and we were hanging out. Every church, every seat in this church, in this auditorium was touched by someone yesterday and prayed over. Like almost every Saturday we do that. But I felt a heaviness there and then I came in this morning and I got here around 8.30 and I felt a heaviness there and I was reminded of the altar call and I watched us worship and I watch us so much better than the rest, right? It's that one thing and I watch us and, and I know, many of you I know and I've seen you, I've seen you outside of just worship and not all of you are as introverted in life as you are when you worship. Please take this as a loving pastoral moment. What I'm seeing though is a church, a church, it's not just here, it's other places, that is heavy, that is burdened, the weight of life and the, uh, just the seasons, the seasons of life. I see it in serving. I see it in worship. I see it in other people's churches. When I talk to them, I hear about it. Like, it's just like everyone seems to be heavy. And like, this feels like a, a tug of war sometimes. And I got a glimpse with that altar call. I'm able to sense what's in the room. I, honestly, I show up and I'm like, God, can you help me get past myself? What's happening in the room? I walked around and greeted many people this morning, not just to say hi, and I'm not a politician, but really I want to sense what's in the room and what's happening in the room. And man, I just want the spirit of heaviness to be lifted off of us so that we can worship in freedom. I've been pretty unwavering recently in my messages about beholding and the command to delight in the Lord in spite of what we feel like, in spite of what we're dealing with. And I know we're all dealing with something and we're all facing something, right, in life. But just like I preached that message when Paul was in jail, he was dealing with something. He was facing something. His physical body felt some type of way, right? emotionally, spiritually. He's in the dark, yet he was worshiping. He was delighting himself in the Lord, amen? Delighting himself in the Lord. And God showed up in that moment. He showed up in that moment. Not only did it impact Paul, but many around him, amen? And so I don't, I'm not 
preaching at you like the, the, I'm preaching at all of us. First off, I'm speaking to all of us. I'm not, I'm not trying to preach down because you, you look introverted when you're worshiping. I'm just trying to make us aware of what we're carrying. There's miscarriages in the room. That's happened recently. There's major health problems that have happened recently. There's financial things in the room. There's businesses that are having a really hard time. Heck, there's people like me with four kids and groceries cost you a car payment every week. Amen is right. It's expensive. It, it, dare I be ocean way and say, it's real in them streets. I get it. I get it. I bet you I could go through the room and touch every single one of you and, and ask you to speak to this right now and you would have something that, man, I'm going through this and I'm going through that. Young people included. Young people included, not just, not just adults. I get it. However, when do we decide that in spite of that, we're still going to pivot towards the Lord in worship? And that, that doesn't mean that all of us aren't doing that or anything. I'm not saying that at all. I know that that's a hard shift sometimes. In spite of my struggles, in spite of what I'm walking through right now, I realize many in this room are deconstructing in a sense, and those online, maybe those who will watch this later, are deconstructing. Like what they've known is kind of coming apart right now. It's not always a bad thing. When you deconstruct, there's really two directions. You go away from Jesus or towards him. My prayer is that we deconstruct towards him. Maybe our are ways that we always thought were the only way. Maybe we tear those up and find what God's really doing in this day and in this hour. I want to pray for us, man. That the Lord would touch those who are sick in body. That He gives supernatural energy to those sick in body. That He brings healing to those. I want to pray for us. those worries and those cares that the Holy Spirit will give you the boldness to cast them at the feet of Jesus. That the marital strife that the Lord will heal that. That he'll bring that. He'll bring that down. It seems to be peaking at an 8 or a 10. But the Lord will bring that down. That the resentment will leave. The harboring unforgiveness will leave. Generational curse that's on someone. That it be revealed. That it be dismissed in the name of Jesus. Financial burdens, man. The Lord provides. The Lord provides. I pray that we walk in obedience to the scripture, put ourselves under the blessing of the Lord. The Lord provides. Jesus, you know every need in this room. You know everyone that's struggling in whatever way and capacity that they are. Jesus, thank you that you will get down in the middle of our struggle with us. And you will meet us there. Now you will extend a hand and pull us out of the mud. He has not left us. He has not forsaken us. He is not bored. He has not disappeared. He still is our ever-present help in time of need. He still is faithful and true. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us and you don't forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that you draw us into repentance. Change the way that we see things. Change the way that we think. May we turn our gaze to you. 
Repentance brings refreshing is what it says in Acts chapter 3. Repentance is not a bad thing, guys. It is a glorious thing. Repentance doesn't mean you're in trouble. It means that God loves you and that you're paying attention. Lord, would you move within us? Move us to repentance so that we can be refreshed. Come on, this is good news and this is a good Jesus. When his presence shows up, Israel danced, they sacrificed, they shouted, they sang, they worshiped. Come on, there's plenty of churches plenty of churches in the world that look like a morgue. This is not going to be one of them in Jesus' name. This is not an attempt to stir something emotional. This is like, man, I see it in Scripture. The church comes alive. The God who delivers, He's delivered all of us. Amen. Some of you in this room used to be an alcoholic. God delivered you. We're celebrating. Some of you were in adultery. God delivered you. We're celebrating. All of us were dead in our sin, far from God. And the good news is Jesus didn't say, jump through a hula hoop, do, do, do two cartwheels, give me this offering, and you'll be saved. Jesus left heaven, came to earth. The Word became flesh. He put skin on. He dwelt among us. He climbed up on a cross that was destined for each and every single one of us. And He said, I'll pay this because you can't pay it. He purchased our sin, our shame, our guilt. He purchased the old us to give us a new life, to give us a new life in Christ. Man, that is worth praising. That's worth saying you're so much better so much better than the rest. He's so much better in your past life. He's so much better in your strongholds. He's so much better in the guilt that the enemy wants you to carry. He's so much better than the shame. He's so much better in the sexual sin. He's so much better than the abandoned father that gave you all kind of trauma. He's better than all of that. Amen. Amen. Y'all calm down. Y'all calm down. We're not even going to go there right now. We've got some ministry to do in here. Thank you, Lord. We'll get them at the end. We'll get them at the end. Y'all need a little bit of time to tune up. And just, just to go ahead and let you know that I can't see a clock. The clock's not up there today. So whatever happens, happens. Amen. I will say this. <laughs> y'all don't really mean that. So y'all, if you really meant it, never mind. Let me stop. Let me not get my feels. Listen, do me a favor. Find somebody really quick and testify. Just testify that he's so much better fill in the blank for him. Testify. Come on. Don't, no, no, no. Church is a participation sport. Get up. Find at least one person and tell them, testify to them that God is so much better than whatever it is that he's delivered you from. Come on, Brianna. Get up and tell them. Come on. Testify to what God has done. Adam, get up and testify. Tell the people that God is so much better that he gave you Jamie and you did marry your ex-girlfriend. Amen? Tiff, Tiff, can you come out? Skylar and Eden Gray, can you come up here? Here's a couple sacrificial lambs this morning. Praise the Lord. Somebody loves you. I have no idea who that was. Was that you, Jenna? Hey, uh, shout out to uh, Coach Hour and his incredible wife, Kristen. She just had hip replacement on, um, on Friday. 
And, uh, and, and I got a chance to pray with her on Friday. They're probably watching online right now in Minnesota and uh, recovering from hip surgery. So we thank God that you got your hips back. Amen. So be praying for them. Hey, so uh, listen, uh, I've known these guys for a long time. They're an incredible couple, um, Skylar and Eden. And, and Eden, uh, Eden gave up what she thought her dream was with God to pursue what she really believed God was calling her to and, and left the college and came to Bold City College and SEU. And, and she graduated and did an incredible job. You guys have probably seen her. Uh, up here on the platform and in other places and just incredible couple and uh, this is their last Sunday with us uh, they said that um, our church is lame and they're leaving I'm just kidding <laughs> but no we've been doing a pastor's breakfast uh, you guys have heard me talk about that a, a couple of times and and they they have a relationship with one of the pastors at the breakfast and and they've known them for, I don't know, a long time, really long time since you were a kid, about as long as you've known me, right? And so maybe longer, I don't know. But he needs a worship leader. And so Eden and Skylar are moving on to go and to, to lead that house in worship. And I'm sad, I'm grieving, but I'm also celebrating because we talked for a while on the phone and she believes that God has deposited something in them and on them in this house that they're going to go take and deposit in a new house. And so I want to celebrate that, man. Part of that leading with an open hand as much as we want to keep a hold of them because we love them. And, uh, and so they're going to have a season where they go help out and, and then see what God does from there. Could you just extend your hand towards them? And pray for them and feel free if the Lord puts it on your heart to stop them on your way out, to pray more, speak life over them, encourage them, do whatever the Lord tells you to do. So, Father, thank you so much for Eden and Skylar. And thank you, Lord, that this is ascending. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would continue to order their steps and continue to bless them, Lord. Thank you for what you've put on their life. And God, grace them for this next season. Grace them, Lord. Protect them as well, Lord. Shield them. Surround them with incredible support. And Father, I pray that as they stand on a platform in another church, Lord, I pray that heaven invades that room. And I pray that the, that worship will be vertical. That Jesus, you'll be the honored guest in that room. I pray for a sweet, sweet presence of God in that room. So as she leaves with the heart of a Levite, Lord, I pray that she raises up other Levites. I pray that their greatest ministry will be unto the Lord. Unto the Lord. And I pray that that church be greatly impacted by that. Lord, we give you all the thanks and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. They didn't know I was going to do that today. But I felt prompted to do that, led to do that today. Also, at the end of service, don't rush out of here. Uh, we got a dear friend, uh, Daryl Metcalf from One for Israel, who's in here with us today. And at the end, I threw him on the spot late last night and said, hey, why don't you get up and share for two minutes about it? And he was like, oh, sure. And so uh, at the end of service, uh, he's going to share something for a couple minutes. All right. So uh, I've titled today a, a Wise Decision. A Wise Decision. I used to hear from my grandmother when I was younger, um, when I would do stuff. Remember, my grandparents played a vital role. Get this open. These lids are tight. Um, she played a vital role in helping to raise me. Incredible woman. But I would obviously do things, and uh, I think my wife would agree that, or just like, why did you do that? My grandmother used to always say, that wasn't a wise choice. I used to wonder what that word meant. All I knew, though, 
God, that sounded like a, like a well jumped in my water bottle. I don't know if y'all could hear that. That was loud. All I knew is like growing up, I heard that so much. I was like, I'm just not wise. <laughs> like there's just whatever wisdom is, I ain't it is what I used to think, right? And I would even venture out to say that there probably wasn't a, an abundance of wisdom in me um, when, when, I, uh, when I started this. And, uh, and I can tell you, though, this year has been incredible when it comes to wisdom. One, because I prayed for it at the beginning of the year. But two, every time I let my beard grow out, there's signs of wisdom in it. And it feels like every time I shave and then it grows a little bit more, there's just more. And so I, I, my, Tiff likes when my beard grows out. I don't because I have one of those beards that looks really suspect, like it doesn't connect everywhere, right? For those of you who are super blessed, like, like Adam's got a glorious beard, dude. Like his lines are there. He's had a beard since he was eight years old. That might be partially true, right? And so, um, but mine like grows in spots, right? And so it's like, man, it's just, you, I, I look like I'm still growing up sometimes when my beard grows out. However, the more I shave it, the more gray comes in. And Tim's like, man, why don't you let it grow? And I'm just, I'm in this place where I'm like, Lord, I just want more wisdom. So I'll just keep shaving to see where we are on the wisdom uh, category. And Rogaine is not getting thrown on it, right? <laughs> Nothing artificial. I want all the realness that God has, amen? And so, um, so I titled today, A Wise Decision, and I want to update you on the building, but also I realize that we probably need to point you in a direction and let you know kind of where we're going. Some of you have been able to read between the lines and pick up on it. Many people have not, and, uh, and they, they're like, this is, this is changing, but the change hasn't been clearly communicated. I understand that. I get that. That is no one's fault except for mine, because I'm the communicator here. So, um, so I understand that. I take full responsibility for that. However, I want to let you know where we're going can't be summed up in 45 minutes here, that I can touch on it and talk about it, open up that conversation, and then continue it all through January and February is my plan in my heart. You know, our church turns 10 years old the first week of February next year. It's still a baby. Like, it really is. Like, it's still, it's still a baby in, in many ways. But that, that's pretty incredible to think that a lot of us in this room have given a whole decade of our life to something. Amen? And so, um, so this week, I hope to start the conversation. Next week, I really want to preach on Jesus being born and the importance of it, right? Like, there's just a part of God that you can't see if Jesus isn't born. And I, I want to talk about that because that's actually exciting to me to talk about. And then on the 24th for Christmas Eve, you can just worship the Lord wherever you are. Because we're not going to be in here. All right. And so if, if you want to go to another church, if you want to go to your family's church, if, if you want to stay home, whatever that looks like, um, if you want to worship with us, I encourage you to do that. We are, we're taking ourselves away. And so you will have to come all the way to Colorado to worship with our family. Amen. My wife was determined to see snow this year, and we're going to make sure she sees some snow for Christmas this year. Amen. And so we'll be there. And if you show up, you can have a Christmas Eve service in the parking lot if you want. Totally cool. Give you full permission. Amen. Uh, but then on the 31st, we're going to have a family service in here. And what I mean by that is we'll have, I think, I don't, I don't see Jess. I see Pastor Randy. You might be able to correct me or, or Gabs or somebody might be able to. But on the 31st, we know many of you will be traveling. However, if you're here, we want to encourage you to come to service because what we're going to do is we're going to worship and we're going to thank God for what he's done this year. We're also going to pray for leading into next year. And so we'll be in here and I think four and below, we will have kids for four and below. Um, but if they're five and above, you know, be here. There won't be any long drawn out message or anything like that. We're going to get in here. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to celebrate. And then we're going to go hang out with our family and have fun on the 31st. Amen. Awesome. And, uh, and that's good. You, you can't use the Gator Bowl as an excuse because it's on the 29th. I know that because my Tigers will be in it. And, uh, and I'll be down there watching them. Amen. So 
I want to update you on the building and lead into my message. Le uh, leading up to 2020, our church, I, I wrote all this last night, so if you see me reading, I, I thought this out and, and wrote this down last night. If it's not clear, well, maybe I'm just not a good thinker, but praise the Lord. Leading up to 2020, our church was running 1,100 on a Sunday for two services, uh, 9 and 11 a.m. When COVID hit, it pushed us into an online-only service for months. How many of you remember that, right? The, I, this isn't a pastoral thing where I want to vent and talk about me. You would be blown away at the emails that I got about being a coward for not having service in spite of, of, uh, of the COVID stuff. So well, many people thought we just weren't having service because we just didn't want to and we were scared of COVID. No, we weren't having service because we were 1,100 when we moved into COVID, and then there's no possible way. If you've ever been to the chapel, have you ever tried to get 1,100 people in there? First off, you'll get in trouble by the fire marshal because you, you can't have that many people. And so we were navigating that and learning how to do online services like most of the world, right? We had no choice because the school board, and this isn't a knock against them, they have their own responsibilities, right? This, the school board would not allow us to meet in this room. And so towards the end of 2020, we did move into the chapel on Main Street because we were, just, anybody remember that? We were just like, we got to start meeting. And so we met in the chapel with no kids area, and we were doing four and some weekends, five services on a Sunday. Anybody remember that marathon? Well, a guy in our church brought his RV up there so I could take naps. Like that's how real it was. And I did. I went in there, and I'd be like, if anybody needs me, find somebody else because I'm, I'm going to sleep for a little bit, right? And so we did four or five services that day with no kids ministry uh, during that time. We also had a large piece of property under contract uh, off of Max Leggett Parkway um, in, in that area. And so we, we had that, and we were excited uh, at the hopes of maybe building this big facility, right? Everybody kept telling us, oh, you're 1,100. This is what they say in the church world. I'm giving you a behind-the-veil look. In the church world, like, oh, if you're 1,100, when you build a building, you'll double in size within the first six weeks because people will take you more serious. They'll show up. Um, it just speaks something permanent in the community. So everybody's like, you need at least 1,000 seater which is bigger in this room, by the way. And so we're like, oh, okay, all right. And so we had this big piece of property under contract and we were looking to go that way. But when we started meeting at the chapel, I felt a real pull to that property. We were able to get out of the contract uh, with the large piece of property and move in a different direction. Um, the guy who owned that uh, comes to our church. He's very graceful and, and, uh, and allowed us to get out of that that piece of property, didn't cost us anything. It was, it was a blessing, right? And so we decided to look at the possibility of building a building uh, at the chapel location. Stay with me. I know this sounds super businessy, but you need to know. If you don't know, you don't know, you know? And so I need to do this. And then I promise you I'll get into some preaching. We decided to look at a possibility of building a build, like a building on site uh, where, where the chapel is in the Circle Love property. By this time, we were meeting in the school again, and the school had presented us with a COVID cleaning cost. I think I might have brought that up in service a couple of times. At least I know I talked to, to quite a few people about it. The COVID cleaning cost was going to cost us roughly $100,000 a year just to clean this room that we couldn't clean, but the school had to have it cleaned a certain way. And so we met for a number of months getting those invoices, and me being from Motion Way, I was like, hey, I'll, I will pay the invoice if you will show me that you're doing this. Because we would come in here like we do every Saturday, and we clean the building. Like, we clean it. Like, like Miss Terry vacuumed this whole room yesterday, right? Many people were in this room cleaning the seats that you're setting in and helping set all this up, Right? And so when the school says, hey, you got to pay this big number for cleaning, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, we're going to pay a big number. We're going to get a big cleaning, amen? And, uh, and so after I pushed back long enough, they were just like, you know what? Forget it. We just keep meeting. And so, so we just continued to meet. But when we got that word, it obviously, like, 
it struck a chord with me that, man, if we're going to have to pay $100,000 in cleaning, we might as well try to build our own building. Amen? And so I took it kind of as like almost like a confirmation, move forward and go after it. So we began the process and the conversation uh, of building a building on site at the Circle of Love property. That conversation started in the three to four million dollar range. And we were like, praise the Lord, let's go after it, right? Well, as we continued um, to get into that process, the lender that we chose told us, said, hey, here's what you need to do to move forward. We need you to raise $600,000 to move forward. So in 2021, that's what we did. We brought it up here, and I told you, like I always tell you, listen, if we want to move into what God's calling us to, this is what we're being told. This is what we'll do. We determine the pace we get there. We need $600,000 more to, to sit at the table and have the conversation and to start making it happen. And so... Uh, so I brought that out to you, and within eight months, without beating you up, if you were here, you know, every, every week's sermon was not a giving sermon. Every week, we weren't hounding people for money, but we just would bring it up every couple weeks. Hey, beyond fun, beyond fun, you know, if you want to give to it. Within eight months, we got the 600000 And I was like, well, praise the Lord. We didn't have to twist no arms. We didn't have to hijack a service or anything like that. So we were in a good place. And we did that all in 2021. And as we continued to pursue the building, guess what happened? The building price continued to drive up, like everything else has with inflation, right? And so if you build anything in the past two years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The price eventually moved to over $9 million. Yep, I did that, yep. That was, that was a real cough from Rachel. That was a real cough. And so if we pursued a building at that number, it would be the death of our church or me. And I'm not willing to let either one happen, right? Uh, I, I've talked to a number of pastors who have, who have built stuff recently, um, even guys who are doing stuff now who said, I wish I would have did this in 2018. And even guys that said, I wish I would wait till after this year and do it later. But a lot of guys have told me that have done this, that have wisdom in this area, this is crazy, man. This is crazy. This, is, this will be the death of the church. And so wisdom says we can't do that. So I, I, I don't, I'm not bringing you discouraging news. Hold tight. I'm bringing you good news. Did you hear the splash again? It's so far. It's like a three-foot water bottle. So today, I... I'm just going to be honest, I stand before you, the renderings that we showed you, um, the vision that we cast for that building, it's not an option for us right now. Like It, it would completely crush us. Um, I'm actually energized in that great piece standing up here telling you guys this. At the beginning of this year, uh, I was reading 1 Kings chapter 3, when the Lord comes to Solomon in a dream and he says, ask me for whatever you want whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon asked for a discerning heart and wisdom. And the Lord gave him that and everything else. And so that's what I did at the beginning of this year. I've wrestled with this all year because I've known that, God, there's not, this is impossible for us right now. It's not. And I don't want to make it sound like it's impossible for God to do it. It's absolutely possible for God to do it. However, I also know this, that his plans are not our plans, his ways are not our ways. I want to surrender to what he thinks we need to do. I want him to guide us on this. And, uh, and listen, so I've asked the Lord, that was at the beginning of the year, I wanted his wisdom in my life, but I also wanted his wisdom for the life and the health of our church. That's why I titled today, A Wise Decision. We would be foolish to move forward with something that we can't afford just like any of us would personally. We do this all the time in American culture, right? We overspend. We buy things that we don't need to buy. We're all guilty of it, I'm sure, in, in, in many ways, but many churches are too, and I don't want to do that. First off, you need to understand this. I'm not a fundraiser. Like, that's not my responsibility. That's not my job. I've had many people in the church um, world that helps you raise funds for building 
They, like, we met with these guys. Pastor Randy will tell you. We sat on a phone call on the way back from, from Baton Rouge from a guy who helps churches raise millions of dollars. Tell me that this is what you need to do. He literally was shaping out the preaching calendar for us. I said, this doesn't feel right. And, and now this is how you, this is the only way you're going to be able to do it. This is how often you have to do it. This is the campaign, all that. And I was like, man, this does not feel right. And, um, and this guy makes a living off teaching churches to do this. And I'm not saying they're bad or anything like that. I just didn't feel graced for that. I didn't feel it at all. I feel like this would be foolish. I'm not a fundraiser. And I have zero interest in hijacking every service for the next two years to raise funds for a building that maybe we shouldn't be in. You know what will happen if I do that? You'll start bad-mouthing me on the Internet. You'll leave and go somewhere else. All he ever talks about is money. All he ever wants is money, 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 money. You'll start overanalyzing my life. He wants money because look at him, right? Not all of you would do it, but that's the kind of stuff. that We've already heard it, and I'm like, I feel like we have the most passive giving opportunities in the world of all churches, right? Like, we don't even put a bucket in front of your face. It's because we don't trust half of you, but we don't put a bucket <laughs> in front of your face. Proverbs 1.7 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My life has been filled with bad decisions early on. I wouldn't tell you that I, every decision I've made as the pastor of this church has been the greatest. No, by no means. However, I love Jesus and I want his wisdom and I want his instruction and I want his leadership because this is his church. The Bible instructs us to get wisdom. You should want this if you're a Christian, to get wisdom. And this is what's happened in this situation. Proverbs 4, 5, get wisdom, get understanding, right? Wisdom is don't make this move. Understand and find out what I'm doing in this time and in this hour. And, uh, and let's go from there. The Lord is the one who gives wisdom. The Bible tells us to get it. Where does it come from? It comes from the Lord. And this decision, I can promise you, at least on my behalf, I've invited many others into praying over this, but at least on my, my behalf, this has been bathed in prayer. Bathed in prayer. Proverbs 2, 6 says, for the Lord gives wisdom. God, give us wisdom. Myself and others on our team and in our church, we have a real peace because wisdom has entered our hearts. I'm telling you, I'm up here, and I don't feel regret. I don't feel shame. I don't feel, I feel a real peace and a real grace on this. Because Proverbs 2.10 says, for wisdom will enter your heart. And listen, we plan to continue to seek wisdom moving forward. Proverbs 3.21 says, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Whatever we do, I can promise you, there will be a prayer life built around the decision. This thing will be bathed in prayer. And listen, I have a renewed passion for this house and what the Lord has called me to. And I, I, I know this is a catchy, cliche church saying, but I really believe this with all of my heart, that truly the best is right in front of us. I feel more at home in my own skin right now than I have in the life of this ministry. I'm more at peace. I'm in an incredible spot with the Lord. And, uh, and I'm grateful for it. And so I'm excited about what's coming. Proverbs 19, 8 says, the one who gets wisdom loves life. You can't get wisdom apart from Jesus. You get wisdom, you get Jesus. And Jesus will change your life. The one who cherishes understanding will soon prosper. And that's the byproduct. And in Jesus' name, that is exactly what will happen. We will soon prosper. I do believe the Lord has a house on the way. I do. In the life of our church for the first four or five years, I always said this. If we have to always set this up and tear this down, is it still worth it? Absolutely, it's still worth it. You know what I used to say that for? I used to always back, is it still worth it to reach your lost ones, your lost loved ones, your lost friends and all that? Yeah, absolutely. You know what I say for now? It's still worth it because we can corporately come together and we can worship the Lord together. That's a focus on the great command. Secondary is the great commission. 
So what's next? And what about the 600,000 raised? Because I know some, so many people get a little suspect about church finances. <clears throat> I'm glad you asked. Pastor Randy just went shopping last week. Look at his shoes. I'm just kidding. Good news. We still got the 600,000. It hadn't disappeared. It hasn't been spent. And so we're currently exploring prayerfully the possibilities of a facility that is much more affordable for us. I'm not prepared nor ready to share with you what those possibilities are, um, but that we do have 10 men in the church that I've invited to sit at the table with me to help me make a wise decision that mostly work in this profession. There's a few others that I'd like to talk to as well, but I'd love to sit and be able to make, make sure that what we do next is a collective decision from guys who understand this, this business and understand what's going on. And we haven't been sitting on our hands either. Listen, we've been working on this. We, we own a completely designed building, everything. Like we own all the engineering work that's been done for a facility. However, we can't, listen, we're on a Honda budget trying to get in a Cadillac. It just ain't going to work. Amen? And so, so we're pivoting. We haven't been sitting on our hands. Two, we were given just over two acres at the Circle of Love property, which we're grateful for. We have a legacy there that we are going to honor with that facility. And it was never part of plans to ever get rid of that. And I don't foresee that happening at all. And if we did, we'd have to give it to another ministry. What we did know is in 2018 that the two and a half acres next to it, we needed to buy it. And so we did in 2018. And in 2018, I stood right here and I said, I believe within five years, we'll pay that property off. That we will pay that off. And this is year five, and we paid that property off. And so part of the figure for the building was lumping in the mortgage for that as well into $9 million. Once we, once we pivoted and realized, like, hey, this isn't going to happen, we wrote a $378,960.78 check to them and said, we will pay that off right now because that's wise so that we don't continue to pay the uh, the interest, right? Do you know what it feels like to write a check that big? Me neither. Terry did. I didn't. <laughs> that was a wise decision. Uh, we've also made improvements at the chapel recently. And, uh, and like one of my favorites is we built a new basketball court for the youth so they can get smoked by their pastors in basketball. And if one of them tell you that that hasn't happened, I'll tell you they're liars. And I'll pull Brian Jones up here and he'll remind them. Also, I want to let you know this, too. Our church hasn't pivoted from being a generous church. Like, we have not stopped. $284,201.63 has been invested in local and foreign missions through this house this year. And so the Beyond Offering that's coming, it's for the house that we're going to step into. We're going to continue to pursue that. We're going to continue to be a good steward and stack that so that we're prepared to make a move when we're going to make a move. Amen. And so when you get to that, you're going to help us continue to walk into that. And I don't want you to be discouraged. You're like, man, we're, we're not breaking ground. We will one day. We will break ground on what God wants us to break ground on. In the meantime, we need to rally and thank God for this space and this place. We're, I'm very grateful for an incredible principal at this school, an incredible favor with the school board. You know, you, you guys have no idea how much they defend us here, that there's people that walk by or drive by and see our signs that are absolutely against the church. They want separation of state and, and, and church. They, you have no idea the conversations that they've had to have defending us about our signage because our signage makes it seem like First Coast is our permanent home, about how we shouldn't be meeting in here. And these guys, these guys bring this to me after they've already dealt with it. They're not asking me to deal with it. And so I'm very grateful for that. And so in this season, I would just encourage you to roll your sleeves up and let's continue to go after God, be thankful that we have a space like this to meet in, get involved, 
Give, serve, be a part of what God's doing here. And, uh, and the Beyond Offering as well. Get involved with that. Remember this about the Beyond Offering. It's not mandatory. Like, you don't have to do it. I would just say, why wouldn't you? And, and if you're struggling financially, I would, I would encourage you to take a look. I'm not, I'm not accusing you of anything. I would encourage you to take a look. Like, how do I steward, right? Like, I understand life can be hard sometimes, right? How do I steward? Am I actually practicing my faith in my finances? And, and challenge yourself to get out of the boat. Get out of the boat and trust the Lord, right? And so I, I wouldn't dare tell you an amount. I wouldn't dare tell you you have to. I would ask you to go pray like I always do every year. Go pray with your spouse and your family. Say, Lord, what would you have us do, if anything? And, and we'll start taking that the next, this next week and the week after. And we're going to pray over it. We're going to believe for God to do something great. But also this week I was moved to lump something into that beyond offering. The beyond offering is about our future home. But then something happened this week, and I really felt uh, the Spirit of God say, make the church a part of this. And I was like, how? Through the beyond offering. And so, um, so we have someone in our, um, in our ministry school that has graduated and actually keeps, continues to hang around, but has felt a call to missions. And so they've been exploring the opportunity of what it looks like to leave us like Eden is and, and Skylar is and to go out to the ends of the earth and take the gospel. And so they were working on something and, and an opportunity came up for them to sit under what I personally believe is one of the greatest missionaries on the face of the planet uh, alive today to sit with them and learn from them for three weeks in, in Brazil. And so, Megan, where are you? Are you in here, Megan? Uh, right in front. Would you come up here really quick? You didn't know you were coming up here, did you? And so, so Megan is going to be with Heidi Baker in Brazil in January, and I want our church to cover her airfare. And here's why, because I know what you're going to do. You guys are going to start emailing me. I've got all these needs, too. Where's Tiffany? Tiffany, can you come out here? And, uh, but she is giving her life to the Lord here. One of the greatest things about this, this young lady is as God has worked through and sorted through her soul, and as he continues to, she is truly submitted to this house. She doesn't ask our opinion and not apply it. She brings us into the messy stuff, genuinely wants it, and uh, and, and she does the hard work, amen? She's set through two and a half years of our ministry school, and God's done incredible work with her. I say two and a half years, a two-year thing, but she just keeps coming and keeps showing up. And, uh, and she's really went after this, and she's really shaped her life uh, to, to, to look like a missionary. And so we're also, we're gonna give part of that beyond offering. We're gonna give that uh, to help make sure that Megan gets where she's supposed to go. And, and I'm telling you, the only reason, only reason that I'm doing this this way is because as I was sitting at my desk, the Lord, I mean, it was like he slapped me in the face and said, this is what you need to do. And I jumped on it immediately. But I wanted to put it before you because I wanted to see, this is really cool. She's about to go to Brazil. Maybe get a parasite. That's part of it. Maybe not. You know what that is? You know what a parasite is on the mission field, right? Quickest way to lose weight. You can figure out how that works, all right? Tiffany will tell you I got one in Guatemala and lost 17 pounds in a week. Praise the Lord. If they offer Cipro, just take it. Just take it, amen? But I want you to be praying for her because this is going to be the biggest, most incredible moment of her life. Amen. Please stretch your hands towards her. Father, thank you so much for Megan and the call that you placed on her. First and foremost, thank you that you've given her a new life, a new life. Lord, we ask that you breathe on this trip, that you mark her forever, that she be changed and she be different. Lord, completely, completely disrupt any plan that the enemy might have. Send her down the wrong road. 
And Lord, I pray that you would give her a heart that constantly surrenders what she thinks your will is. That she constantly surrender that at your feet, Jesus, to really step into what your will is. Lord, we pray that what happens in Brazil not only change other people's lives, but Lord, that you will mark Megan's life and you will change it. That she will come back here more on fire for you than ever. And I pray that what she brings is contagious, Lord, that it leaks all over this room. God, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to send a daughter of the house. We consider it, we consider it a great honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. And so listen, there's, there's another one. The Lord moves on your heart. Just go find Megan. Bless her. Help her. It's incredible. So really quick, what's next? Where are we going? What's happening? I'm aware that many, in our, many people in our church know, like, like I do, that our church has shifted and changed a lot this year. Uh, Pastor Randy, he often refers to it like this. He says, man, we're like a cruise ship making the turn to head in the right direction. The issue with that, as the lead pastor, I've never driven a cruise ship. I've only driven a jet ski. It's kind of a blessing and a curse, right? I tend to move on things fairly quickly. And this new direction of pursuing Jesus personally a certain way, but also dragging the church into it, I, I can't, i be honest, man, it hasn't been like a well-thought-out plan on how to transition, transition the church there. It's just been, man, we're going after it. I'm going after this. This is, this is what I believe the Lord's called me to. This is, I'm going after it. And, and that's what's happened. And I understand that a lot of people have been blindsided by it. They've been shaken up by the turn. What? This is not what I expected. This isn't how we used to operate. Heck, some of the people were on the balcony of the cruise ship. And when I turned it, they just fell off. And they were like, oh my gosh. And some noticed that the direction was changing. They got off this arc to get on another one. Praise God for all of it. Thank God for all of it. I'm reminded while I'm talking about this, I'm reminded of what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. That is exactly what's happening here. We are a church that is learning to prioritize Jesus. Some of you are baffled with that statement. What does that even mean? Like we haven't been prioritizing Jesus. We have in a way, but if you notice, there's one large anchor in our logo and two smaller ones. I think it's real easy for a church to have some values and a mission and things that are important. And I think it's real easy for a church to get busy prioritizing the things of God over God. And we've shifted to say that we're starting here and everything else will flow from here. We're not, we're not starting being his hands and feet. We're starting around his heart this time. And I could be honest with you, I feel like our church is in a rebirth. It's almost like a brand new plan. It's much different, I get it. Listen, we are the bride of Christ. We wanna honor him. We wanna host him. And so we are going in a direction that 100% prioritizes his presence, his actual presence, not his history, not just his history. His history matters. It's in the scripture. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. His history does matter. Talking about him matters. Being in his word matters, but his presence actually shows up in the room. Like we have the ability to host him that way, to give him our undivided attention so that he shows up. We are prioritizing that. That's why you've seen dance. That's why you've seen longer worship. That's why you've seen all of that. It's not because we don't know what we're doing and we're dragging something out. This is actually well-intended and well-planned in a sense in my own life. Like I know, I have an idea what this looks like, what God's calling us to. It's not because we just really like to sing uh, 45 minutes instead of 18. We just understand that many pastors push back on this. It's like God doesn't know what he's doing. God knows exactly what he wants to do. He knows exactly what he wants to do every Sunday. The issue is that the room doesn't always permit him to do it, even in his church. So what does worship do? Worship softens the room and permits him to do what he wants to do. 
what he desires to do. There's been many people touched in worship before a word was ever even spoken. There's been many people walk through the doors. Lisa Robson talked about this yesterday, and I thought it was an incredible three-minute word. We should get her to preach something. She just, three minutes, and she had an incredible word. Now, when you walk in here, there's already been people worshiping in here. And she talked about a word of when they walk through the door, may what they're carrying of the old life just fall dead, what they're, what's burdening them, right? An atmosphere of worship softens the heart prepares the people to receive. Now, I'm no expert scripturally, by no means, but I'm willing to bet 10 days in the upper room, that's exactly what was happening. They were waiting and just ministering and waiting. And then the room was right. And what happened in that room was so powerful, it changes this room today. That's how powerful it was. We are prioritizing his presence. That's the big anchor, anchored in his presence, anchored in his family, right? Anchored in his mission. We're prioritizing that big anchor. We're getting really good at going after Jesus. I understand that it's uncomfortable. Some of you are like, well, I'm I'm not really like that, right? There's been a lot of people that weren't like that, that became like that when the presence of God showed up, right? When his presence shows up, it it changes things. I didn't grow up like that. Well, you're still growing up, so continue to grow. Continue to mature. Continue to grow. And and remember, too, man, when we host his presence, it's to prepare us for an eternity in his presence. Do you think? Do you think that we're ever going to get bored in heaven? Worshiping the Lord? No. No. Not a chance. Listen, he's got to be our one thing. Psalms 27, 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, the presence of God, all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. You ever wondered why we start with Thanksgiving now? You ever wonder why the worship leaders constantly encourage you to give thanks, to sing your own song, to minister to the Lord? Many of us, were like, man, we don't know how to do that. It's okay. We're learning it here. Be okay being uncomfortable, learning some new things. You want to know why? Psalms 104. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Oh, man, we're walking into his presence with thanksgiving on our heart. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And his courts would praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. This is why we do this. And to say, hey, man, we're only going to do it for 18 minutes. I think we're robbing God of what he deserves. Yeah, but you don't understand. I've got all these plans and I got all these things. That's not, I, I get it. I do understand. Your priorities are out of line. That's harsh, isn't it? I know. I'm there. I'm there. I pastored a church that prioritized our priorities over God for many years. Not going to do it. Not interested. How come we can sit and dwell? How come we stayed up Monday till midnight watching the team lose to the Bengals, and they shouldn't have lost to them, but that's in a whole nother sermon. We stay up till midnight, get up and go to work at four or five, six in the morning, right? But God forbid this service be two hours. We praise him. Why? Because he rescued us like Israel did. Psalms 22. Yet you were enthroned as the Holy One. You're the one Israel praised. He's enthroned upon our praises. We praise him. We praise him. Why? Because he rescued us. Israel praised God because he rescued them time and time again. We are worshiping. Why do we worship so long? We're worshiping because we seek the king. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, what did he say? But seek first the kingdom. How do you seek first the kingdom? Seek the king. Seek the king and you'll always get the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Guys, this is not because we're trying to create a service that's an emotional high. It's not because we're trying to be different. 
It's because we want to see the presence of God actually show up. I believe he actually will, and I believe he actually does. We worship together so he can show up and take over. So when we worship and we enter his courts with thanksgiving, we're saying, man, we're thankful, God, that you would show up in a room like this with a people like this, that you would come. And we want you to come. This is why we start that way. Come, come, Lord Jesus, come, right? We start that way. And then you know what we pivot to in our praises? And this is my heart. We want you to come, not just sit and watch, but we want you to take over. And so we have an agenda, we have a plan, but we're willing to sacrifice that plan to step into whatever plan you have. If you want to stop the service and pray for the sick, we'll stop it and pray for the sick. If you want to do this or that, we want you to do this or that. I know it's a little scary, isn't it? Oh, that just means you're not prepared. No, I'm prepared to host the Lord. want to host them. And listen, we worship together so that he can show up but also take over. Remember what I talked about weeks ago. I don't want to handle the presence of God. I don't want to ask for him to come and then tell him how he comes and what he does when he shows up. I want to surrender to his presence. That, and here's the thing. Most of us are scared because we think that turns things into a circus doesn't. It doesn't. Remember Matthew 18, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. For those of you watching online, sick, working, I understand. But when you can get back in here, you need to be back in here. You need, because there's certain things that happen in the room you just can't, you can't experience online. Two or three are gathered. Two or three are gathered under the name of Jesus. He's here. Amen? Listen, you guys ever been to a restaurant? You've seen something on the menu. You're like, yeah, I want that. I want that. And then what's the server say to you? Well, we don't have that. Sorry, we don't have that. We're all out of that. You know who else does that besides restaurants? Churches. We have this. We have a place of freedom. We have a God who will set you free. We have the glory of the Lord. We have the power of God. We have the gifts of the Spirit. We have all this. We have it. And then you show up and you're like, oh, it's not here. It's not here. Not this house. Not this house in Jesus' name. Not this house. When we say the power of God is here, it's because the king is here. It's because he actually is. Remember this, 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. The more we host his presence, the greater the demonstration of power will be in this house. Guys, he didn't just say it for kicks and giggles, that you will heal the sick. You'll deliver the oppressed. You'll raise the dead. He didn't say, man, this would be cool for them to talk about so people come to see and then it doesn't happen. We got to foster an atmosphere that permits him to move that way. Like Moses, his presence is what's going to separate us. It's what's going to distinguish us from everything else. Exodus 33, 16, when God begins to tell Moses, this is what I want you to go. And do, Moses says, how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Power in the presence of God. King David understood the importance of prioritizing the presence of God and having it at the center of all that Israel did. He prioritized it so much, thousands were assigned to minister to the Lord morning and night. Thousands were assigned to worship the Lord, to make offerings and sacrifices to the Lord. And here's the next thing you need to know. We are becoming a word and spirit 
church. A word and spirit church. If you would have asked me two years ago if we were this, I would have told you, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're this. I see it happening now. I see it happening now. What does that even mean? It means we prioritize the word of God. It's been a priority in this church since day one, but also now we're learning to get deeper into the word of God, to put it in context, right? And and it is a priority. Listen, you guys have been in services here. There's probably been three of them in, in, in the life of our church where maybe the sermon didn't go the way that it was supposed to go, but somebody ministered and still shared the word of God. It's a priority in this house. We prioritize the word of God, the reading of it, the teaching of it, the singing of it, and definitely the application of it. We believe it's alive. and We believe that we honor Jesus every time we read it. Amen. We also prioritize giving the Holy Spirit room to minister. And this is the thing I think we maybe suffered with in, in many regards. This requires more time on a Sunday morning. This requires for you maybe to get a little more uncomfortable and be okay with it. We honor as gifts and we give them room to be operated in a healthy expression. Listen, guys, he wants to show up. and He wants to do something. I come every Sunday now with an expectation to see that. Not only see it, but I give him space to do it as well. And then finally, I'll just close with this. And then I'll continue this conversation all through January and February. We are prioritizing prayer. You know what those ministry moments are when we come out here? And I hit my knees and I'm wondering what's happening. You know, and I'm praying and I'm asking the Lord, what do you want to do in the room? And you know what altar calls are? And listen, we have did it for many, many years. We used to have a timer for prayer. Wow is right. We used to have a timer for prayer. You want to know why? Because prayer was something spiritual that transitioned us to the next part of the show. It's happened that church is all over. And what we'll do is we'll say, man, it's, it's good stewardship of people's time. Prayer equals relationship. If you don't have a prayer life, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Because prayer is communication. And it's two-way communication, by the way. This is not like the old Nextels when you chirped and you could talk into it and the other person couldn't talk back to you. Many of us treat our prayer life like that. Everyone in their late 30s, 40s, and 50s understood what I'm talking about. The rest of you young bucks, just Google it. There was a day that was the coolest phone out. How many of you remember that? Somebody gave me that now, I would throw it out the window. But it's communication and relationship is two-way. Prayer is also learning to hear from God. I don't want to get on that because I I could preach that all day. But we are becoming a house to prioritize that. When I come out and do the ministry moment, you know what that is? That's a demonstration corporately of intercessory. Intercessory prayer. It's a big topic. We could talk about it for months, actually. and we, We probably will. And we can learn it. But intercessory is simply this. Somebody positions themselves between Jesus and earth. That I'm going to stand in the gap and allow the Lord to use me as an instrument to intercede, to intervene, to be a, a, a vessel that can pray on behalf of the Lord for something or someone. You know, that moves you into some fivefold. That moves you into prophetic as well. And some of you are scared to death because you think if somebody moves in the prophetic, then you got to start calling them prophet. No, you don't. In fact, I would, I, if I pulled the room, I bet you most of the room is more prophetic than they realize. But would never say I'm prophetic because you don't even realize it. Paul, you know what Paul says about the gift of prophecy? You should all desire it. I hope that all of you do it, right? You, you should all desire that, right? I know what some of you are thinking right now, man, that you're starting to get weird. But prayer will move you into, if you develop a deeper prayer life, most likely you will develop a prophetic life as well. Why? Because you're positioning yourself to hear from God more. And if you can hear from God more, guess what? You can speak on his behalf. more. I know your butts are getting numb. I'm taking a long time. I see you shaking. Stand to your feet. Let that blood run to it.
Listen, we are prioritizing prayer. What did, what did he say in three of the Gospels when Jesus flipped the tables? Don't run off unless you got to, for real. Mark 11, verse 17. As he taught them, he said, is it not written, so it's already in the Old Testament, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you've made it a den of robbers. So when he says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, there's prayer houses, there's prayer rooms that are popping up all over the country, all over the world that aren't attached to the local church. Why? Because the local church isn't praying like it should. We will launch a prayer room beginning in 2024. That little chapel will be a prayer room, right? And listen, it will be quality over quantity. I'm not going to tell you we're going to be doing it around the clock or anything crazy like that. Heck, we can't get our whole church to show up more than 20 times a year. That'll change. That will change. But we're going to launch a prayer room and become, and listen, you know what prayer isn't? It isn't what we used to do online where you would just submit all your prayer requests like I'm a Catholic priest. When I say prayer room, it's a place where we come and minister to the Lord. That doesn't mean he won't answer a prayer. That doesn't mean that something prophetic won't happen, that God won't touch you or anything like that. But the prayer room is unto the Lamb, right? It's not a place where you can just put all your prayer requests. Listen, we're going to teach you to pray in such a way that it's encouraging and it's great to have other people pray, but every time something hits, you won't run to everyone else to pray for you. You'll fall to your knees and pray for yourself. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. You know what that is? We will become a praying church that looks and operates like all nations. I think we need to do a church-wide mission trip to Africa. You want to know why? You ever seen Africans worship? All your stiff back and stiff necks are gone. We'll all need hip replacement like Coach Allen's wife. Amen? All nations. He was referencing Isaiah 56.7. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Listen, what if this is the very thing that takes that stagnant vibe off of your life, that feeling? It's that, man, when we move into a house of prayer, the joy comes. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And then when he talks about the, the father's house becoming a flea market, what he's referring to essentially, a flea market, a den of robbers. He's referencing Jeremiah 7, verse 11. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? That I've been watching, declares the Lord. Listen, in the days where churches, and this is, remember, this is an knack. I'm just letting you know this is not our stream. In the days where churches are launching businesses like crazy, doing this and that, and part, that's all fine. That's not us. That's not this house. That's not us. Right? So if you come to me with this great marketing plan for this great idea to do this outside market in our parking lot, I'm not, I'm not against that. I'm just telling you that's not us. If you come to me with an idea about a prayer meeting, I'm in. I'm already in. I'm already in because that's where we're going. That's where we're going. Listen, you guys are going to hear about this a whole lot in 2024. This is what the Lord's already told me. We're going to get this house in order. We're going to have clear mission, vision, and values because they've changed. Because the leadership of Jason has bowed to the feet of Jesus. Jesus, I want your leadership. I don't want the coolest thing on the internet. I don't want the coolest thing in the city. I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. Jesus, what do you want to do right here, right now, in this spot and in this place? That's what I want. We're going to establish a prayer room to minister to the Lord. You'll see us grow in learning how to become 
ones that host the Holy Spirit and honor him as our guest of honor in here and then allow him to take over. This is going to be fun. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be powerful. And we're going to need a whole lot of grace to learn and grow in this together. I want to encourage you, stay and hang out for it. I know that this time has been stretching for many of us. I'm asking the Lord to give this house grace as we adjust, become what he's called us to be, something that looks more like David's tabernacle. And this is my, my concluding prayer. This is my response. My prayer is that the Lord will provide armor bearers for us in this season like he did David. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 7, you see the armor bearers tell David, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I'm with you heart and soul. And that's my prayer this morning. Lord, this might not be for everybody, but would you give us some that are with us? I didn't even tell our staff that I was closing with that because I want to give them permission if they're like, this is not for us. I want to give them permission to move out of the way and not go that same direction. The only person that I concluded my message with was my wife. I said, Tiff, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a line in the sand. I say, we're going to become a house of prayer. We're going to become a house that focuses on Jesus. We're prioritizing the presence. I can't promise you we're going to do a service in an hour and five minutes anymore. I can't even promise you we'll hit it dead at two hours. I can't promise you that. I can't promise you if you bring your lunch in here, I won't be mad at you. And I can't promise you there won't be some awkward moments and some tension. I can't promise you that you won't get tired. And I can't promise you that I won't get tired. I can't promise you this, though, that our eyes will be fixed on Jesus and that we're going to worship him. I said, Tiff, I kind of need you to be in on this. She's like, I don't really have a choice. I'm married to you. She said, I'm with you, heart and soul, last night. And so that this is how I want to wrap the service off up. And don't feel any pressure. After we pray this, I'll have Mr. Daryl come up and share a little bit about one phrase. He's got two minutes. So if you're hungry, I only gave him two minutes. But you need to hear about what you've been sowing into. And he's worked in politics. He knows how to get it out in two minutes, all right? But I want to. I want my last moment here right now to be, if this is for you, and you already know it, and your heart and soul in for it, man, as Jess just plays, the worship team can come out if they want um, and end us with a song. But I would just love for you to come up here and pray with Tiffany and I and just say, we're in heart and soul. We'll, we'll go after it with you. I didn't ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, do any of that, because and don't feel bad if you're like, no, I'm not ready to come down to the altar, come up to the platform and pray. But even if, I told her, I said, what if it's just us? It's just us. But if that's you, if you're like, no, we're down. We're ride or dies. We're ready to go after this. I'm telling you guys, I'm more rejuvenated than ever. But if it's you, would you come down and just pray? Because when I start preaching this stuff in January and February, I'm going to remind you of this moment. I need that water, Jess. I'm sorry. No, you're totally good. And if you can't come down, if you're online, just put it in the chat. Let us know. And if physically you can't, It's okay. Just join us in prayer. I didn't expect that many of you to come, honestly. I told you you would cry. <laughs> Two weeks in church, praise the Lord. <laughs> would you put your hand on somebody? Jesus, you see what we're doing. You know our hearts. You know our desires. 
and it is you. This is your church. We're your bride. And we honor you as our groom, as our rescuing Savior, our great hope. Jesus, we just want you and you alone. We just want you. We don't want a country club. We don't want something the internet blows up about. We just want your real presence. We want a house that when we show up in it, you show up and we leave different because we've encountered you. We really want to be a people that goes from glory to glory. We really want to be a house that welcomes all nations, all ages, all sizes, Lord. A house of diversity. And Jesus, we want to be a house that when you look down from heaven, that you know that you're wanted in here. We don't want to be a house that's here to tickle ears and, and just feel good. We don't want to preach a gospel that puts us at the center. Jesus, you are the center. We worship you. We thank you. Lord, will you grace us as we try to become this for you? Will you grace us as we pursue this? Will we have grace for each other as we try to live the gospel out in front of each other? Will you give us grace as we try to learn to operate in the things of the Spirit? Will you give us grace as we pursue you? Will you grace our worship leaders and our communicators and our city group leaders and our kids' ministry? We know that this transition has been difficult in our kids' ministry. Lord, will you give us grace Yes, bring people that are of this heart, this mind, and a willingness. A willingness to do whatever it takes, Lord. Whatever it takes, Lord. In kids' ministry, to host the presence of God. Lord, we don't want our kids to be in their 30s and 40s and struggle with the, figuring out how to get in the presence of God. We want them to know and for them to understand so that when they take the churches and they lead them, they won't have to beg for a fire. They'll be living in a fire. We'll do the begging now. We'll break the tradition off. We'll throw away everything we've known. Say, man, here's a blank slate. We're willing to start from the ground up again, Lord, whatever that looks like. But we want it to honor you. We want it to glorify you. We want a demonstration of power in this house because we've hosted your presence. Make us resilient. Protect us. Help us to die to ourselves. Jesus, this is our heart's cry. Whatever you want to do, Lord, we're with you, heart and soul. Whatever you want to do. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.